Hey everyone, welcome to Make Your Peace, a 4YE podcast about Winona Earp. I'm Catherine Mushaw. And I'm Laura Hayes. And today we'll be discussing Season 1, Episode 2, Keep the Home Fires Burning. Wanted to say a quick thank you to everybody for the feedback from our first episode back, and it seemed like a bunch of you were excited to have us back, so that was really appreciated because we were very happy to be back. So thank you so much for that. Thanks, you guys. And Laura, you want to start us off with a recap? Absolutely. While Doc attempts to ingratiate himself to them, the Revenants set their sights on getting Peacemaker out of Winona's hands. Excellent. Thank you. So I I think I know where you might want to start, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Where would you like to start? Catherine, I'm so glad you asked. I would like to start with the episode title for 200, please. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Excellent. So keep the home fires burning. What do you got for me? So when I first read it, I was like a reference to light and our demon of the week is a shadow monster, you know, but I actually looked it up because I was almost certain that it was a turn of phrase that I'd heard my grandparents use when I was younger. And Mm -hmm. it is. Keep the home fires burning is a common reference to keep the campfires, the lights, that kind of thing at one's like home village burning often while part of your population like travels to hunt or something. Mm -hmm. And this was also, this is just trivia. This was also the title of a 1914 British patriotic song by Ivor Novello and Lena Gilbert Ford. And it was a, it was written for world war one. The full title was keep the home fires burning till the boys come home. So it's like another example instead of, you know, like, part of the population going off to hunt. This was, you know, written during that time because so many young men left home to fight in the First World War. I do enjoy it when you bust out with trivia. I love um, trivia. Well, that's, <laughs> every episode title is a song title, right? That could be, I don't know. I can't think of a song off the top of my head that's like purgatory, but that would make sense. Yeah. A quick Google seemed to indicate that there is one. That's cool. <laughs> I literally just Googled it while you were talking. But yeah, I think I want to say most of them are song titles, if not all. So that is kind of fun. So I appreciate your random trivia and you focusing on the title as per usual. Happy to oblige. So we've discussed the title. Where to next? I mean, I mean, you know, a few things happened this episode, a few important things. I mean, we, we got a new character. I don't, I don't know if you want to talk about that yet, though. I mean, she's... How major was that? I mean, do do we want to talk about the introduction of Nicole Hot so soon? You know, I say why not just start off at the top and work our way down? That's not a bad... So start off at the top, so that's shirtless Bobo, right? That is, uh, in fact, (laughs) not shirtless Bobo now. (laughs) I'm sorry. I have to have my fun. But I don't know about you. But I had many, many, many bullet points about Nicole Hutt. So if we can start there, I would be happy to. Please take it away. Excellent. So I did mention last week that Waverly has the best entrance in the series. And I still stand by that. However, Nicole Hutt has the second best entrance in the series. (laughs) With how she just kind of walks into Shorty's right after Waverly conveniently breaks a tap on the bar. And, you know, with the, I didn't know Shorty's had a wet t-shirt competition. And I mean, you just fall in love with her instantly. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if it's like, if it's the undeniable swagger or the dimples, but it's, yeah, it's, it's immediate. I mean, it's also, I, I mentioned that I had a bunch of notes. A lot of them are me just yelling, Nicole, but This is the podcast for that. (laughs) It is the podcast for that. I have a lot of Nicole and then Nicole, her eyes are not down there because (laughs) she's definitely not looking Waverly in the face when she shakes her hand. (laughs) We'll gladly post a screen cap. No, actually one of the, one of my all like joking and flailing aside, one of my favorite moments about Nicole's introduction is very often we get kind of like when you've got somebody who's like an out character and then you've got the character who's not Mm -hmm. and who maybe, you know, 
when you've got, you know, the one character who's not, you get that predatory lesbian thing. Yeah. And we didn't get that with Nicole. It like very nicely kind of towed that line where, you know, she's got that confidence, you know, that swagger, but she's not predatory. No, she's charming. Mm -hmm. So very charming. Maybe I shouldn't have started with Nicole. <laughs> and this is the entire episode this week. Yes. Hi. Sorry, guys. That's it. I'm, I can't handle, thank God we're not doing this because the Xena podcast I co-host, we just talked about the Amazons last week. So thank God we're not doing that this week because I don't think I could handle Nicole Hot and the Amazons in the same week. That would be an overload. It really would be for my poor gay heart. But no, I, like I said, I really appreciate her introduction and it's just like, it's a cute little moment. And one of the things I notice every, you know, I, that gets me every time too, is when she pulls out the business card. Yeah. Like it's not, it's like this beat up little business card. Like how long has that been in your pocket? <laughs> how many times have you taken it out to like, you know, just practice giving it to somebody or whatever it's, she's got like this beat up, you know, this bent up business card that she passes out to, to Waverly. And I just love it. <laughs> that's, that's kind of a really sweet thought that she's just like standing at home in front of the mirror, like practicing, giving out her only business card over and over again. Well, I mean, I don't know. There's just, there's a lot, you know, to really kind of think about with that too, because she's a, she's a rookie. She's a rookie cop. So how many of those has she gotten a chance to, to really bust out with? True. Maybe when you get hired at purgatory, they just give you that one because they don't actually know how long you'll last before you're eaten by coyotes. Wink, wink. <laughs> oh no, that's <laughs> terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> How funny would it be if like the like the actual business card was just like scribbled out names like over and over again? Like it's literally the same card they've been giving to all these rookies. I mean, yeah, that'd just be so sad. But I mean, it's you know, you don't you don't know how many <laughs> how many rookie cops they've gone through. I also want to know like, you know, she, she says something something about like she's been wanting to, you know, check it out and stuff like that. How long, I want to know, like, when she came to town and how long she's been, you know, waiting to talk to Waverly and all that stuff. So I have questions about Nicole, but I adore her. It's just, just quite the entrance. Yeah, she seemed like somebody who had done her homework before she came into the bar looking for Waverly because she made a comment that she's the most popular girl in purgatory. Yeah, and I mean, I guess there's probably an ARP file at the precinct. Oh, I'm sure there is. <laughs> You know, Nedley is certainly familiar with shorties because it's the local bar. So one of the notes I had was like, you know, how like what exactly brought her to the bar? Because she mentions, you know, like she heard something happened at the bar the night before or something like that, doesn't she? Yeah, I think so. But she doesn't really follow up on it. And after season one ended, they did something really cool and created the Road to Purgatory Tumblr blog. Yeah. And what it ended up being was, like, basically Nicole's little diary. Yeah. And one of the entries in it was, you know, this short little, you know, I can't believe I didn't ask her a single question. There was some kind of disturbance at Shorty's bar last night, so I swung by a bit before opening to see if I could get any info and maybe a coffee. Shorty wasn't there, but this girl was, this woman. She really was, or sorry, she was really something. At least I left her my card. I still can't believe I didn't ask what happened. Not a single thing. What is going on with me? So I kind of remember, like I had remembered reading something like that and I could not, I had to go find it. So, <laughs> but I kind of love that because it's like, cause Nicole played it really cool and Waverly was the one who was flustered in this first meeting. But I kind of like knowing that maybe Nicole wasn't as cool as the uh, flailing on the inside. Yes, exactly. And it just, it makes me really happy because I kind of adore Nicole Hall. And I know it's, we're still. Okay, we're doing this spoiler free and we don't know anything in the future, but so this entrance enough. If you weren't already hooked in episode one, I think this episode does it. And especially if you're a queer lady watching the show, this was your hook. This entrance of Nicole Hot, I think, was your hook. Am I wrong? <laughs> no, she got me. Yeah. <laughs> she got all of us. But no, I just, I all of that flailing to just, I love the, that she's not that stereotype. I love that she doesn't push for anything. She's just like, Oh, okay. You're dating somebody. All right. I'm going to go. So I love her so much. 
Me too. I think it was a really terrific introduction. And I just love the character so much. So I guess mild spoilers, you know, you'll see more of Officer Hot. And she's fabulous in all of her dimples. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger spoiler, you'll love her. Yes. Well, even like the next time we see her is when Dolls threatens her. Like when she's coming in all excited with this package because she's like, I'm going to be friendly. I'm going to, you know, make nice to the the weird group that just moved into the precinct, you know, and she gets threatened with treason <laughs> if she ever like com- comes in there again. So it's just, it's hard not to like Nicole when she first comes in. It's true. And it played so perfectly against dolls. Shamir is just like, just straight faced, go away, just no joy at all. Just all business. It played perfectly against that. Oh, I mean that whole, that whole scene, and I just love how Winona's like, doll, she did knock. Because <laughs> his whole thing is, if you come in here without knocking again, and <laughs> Winona's just like, um, <laughs> she did. <laughs> so I do adore Nicole, and it's just, it, you instantly just kind of, you're like, yes, she's adorable, and I love her. And there's your Nicole flailing. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, one thing that... I do not believe I caught the first time I watched this episode, like moving back, like to the beginning, Mm -hmm. the club bespoke that Winona, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and dolls go to and the whole opening scene. I swear to God, I have never seen that many blonde women in one place at one time. It was seriously like every woman who wasn't Winona was blonde. Yeah, I know. I kind of have a note about that. Yeah. Because, of course, we have similar notes. No, I mean, my note about that was just like, you know, we're in this club that Winona wouldn't be caught dead in. Just from what we know so far, we know she's not going to be caught in that bar. And it, that part is, dri- that is driven home by, you've got, like, by the music, by, you've got the, you know, all of the women in there are in, like, club wear, I guess, for lack of a better word. Right. Party wear, whatever you want to call it. And she is, she's the only brunette in a sea of blondes. Yeah. So she stands out that much more. It's like she sticks out like a sore thumb. So, I mean, that was, that, that was 100% intentional. You know, that loading up that bar, all the blonde extras and stuff like that. So I do, yeah, I had a note about that because I don't know if I keyed in on it that much. So like you, I think normally it's just like, oh, okay, this is that scene. And I don't know if I've necessarily keyed into all of the blondes before. Yeah, there's a lot happening, you know, a, yeah. a woman a woman gets her finger bit off, like, and there's a lot going on. So I, w- I think that's, yeah, I think we can be excused for not having noticed that a little bit sooner. But this time around, I was just like, oh my gosh, I totally missed it. Like, they are all, like, the same woman. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's like, the, yeah, it's kind of visually, that same. Visually, yeah. that's all I mean. Yeah, no, I, we, we got you. Yeah. And I mean, with that, with that first, first scene and everything, there's just so much to love about that first scene, you know, where she just busts in and in order to stop this revenant, whose name is Red, you know, after he bites off that poor woman's finger, you know, she just yells out crazy chick with a gun and causes a mass panic. And I just, I love that scene because it's like you go to dolls outside in the car after all of these women are like running out of the bar screaming and he's just like, yep. <laughs> that's my cue. Sounds about right. Yeah. That was actually that was also like one of my favorite moments of the episode mm-hmm. was like red biting off that lady's finger. For, yeah. Well, wait, no, but like for two reasons. One, mm-hmm. she she was way too attractive to be hanging out with him and his shark teeth and his denim vest. Like that. <laughs> we know that's a fantasy. That was that's never going to happen in life. And. <laughs> Two, it was just the obscure, the absurdity was just underscored because it was so gruesome and sudden. So I, I just, I don't know. I liked it. Yeah. If the tongue being ripped out last episode didn't cue you in, the finger definitely would. This is, the show is not afraid to get a little, a little gruesome. You know, it's not afraid to show people losing appendages. One more thing that I want to bring up, like before we move away from the from bespoke, when Dolls gives Winona that BBD issued gun in the car right before she heads in, mm-hmm. 
she says to him, pretty sure only Peacemaker can send revenants back to Hades. And going back to what we discussed last week about Winona's Athena necklace, I thought it was neat that she said Hades and not Hell. Because she does say Hell on the show, and the show has no problem swearing, which is probably why it stood out to me in the first place. It's not like they were worried about watching curse words or anything. So I thought that was cool. And I'm excited to see, you know, in this rewatch, which it will be, it's only like my third, but I'm excited to see how many Greek mythology references we catch as like the season progresses. Yeah, that'd be pretty great. And for those of you who are confused, Lara did talk about the necklace thing in our spoiler bit last time. It's just the the brief thing is the the necklace has a little bit of an ancient Greek thing to it. That's not a spoiler, but if you're confused about the Athena necklace thing, that's the short of it. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I did. I'm so sorry, you guys. So I did put that in the spoiler episode, but all you need to, or the spoiler portion, yeah, all you need to know is that the necklace that Winona wears, and this is not a spoiler, does have Athena carved into the top of it. It's Athena's name in Greek. I went on to say a few more things about that, so I left it under the cut last week. Thank you, Catherine. I totally blanked on that. No, hey, it happens. That's why you have a co-host, right? (laughs) Amen. Yeah, I did catch that about the the Hades line, and yeah, I'm I'm definitely going to be keeping my ear out for, for... Greek references now that we're kind of now that you know I can kind of think about it and kind of clue in maybe a little bit more and I I don't there is one one more thing I think I want to kind of in the same vein when we're talking about like this this trip to the bar when she is handed that gun there are occasions where Winona acts like she's never held a gun before yeah which is fair because she did shoot her father so I'm sure she doesn't really like guns right but Dolls hands her a loaded Glock that, that she then immediately points at him. That's rule number one. That's gun safety rule number one. You don't point a gun at something unless you intend to shoot it. So I just, I had to mention that because I hate it every time when she does that. It drives me nuts because I'm like, I would just want to yell no at my TV. Like smack her with a newspaper, like bad Winona. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Maybe she was just trying to shake him up a little bit. No, I think it was really, it, well, it was played off like she doesn't know what she's doing because she turned the light on kind of willy nilly. But no, it's just that whole opening bit, like where she's, you know, conceal your weapon. And then she's like, ah, shit. <laughs> and uh, I never blow jobs without a please first. I know. that's. I'm going to cross that off. That was one of my favorite quotes. I'm sorry. I, I like, since we were kind of already a little bit talking about it, I couldn't mention that line. I couldn't not mention that line. I even like her follow-up of that joke kills with the Hells Angels. Yes. Because we've already been told she kind of, you know, run, she, you know, has a tendency to run with shady characters or criminals or whatever. Rough crowd. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's better. (laughs) So I kind of, I do like that Hells Angels line as follow-up. Dolls gives us another like important tidbit this week when he shows Winona that photograph of Maldito, New Mexico. Yes, because Winona's like, she wants to, she doesn't understand now, like, she's got validation. Like, dolls call them demons. She's now a member of this group to kill demons. And, you know, she's not crazy. And other people are saying, yeah, you're not crazy. I believe you. And she's kind of, you know, she saw a revenant die by Peacemaker and stuff like that. So it's easier for her to believe in all of this. Right. And like, I want to warn people. I want to keep people safe. And then dolls kind of takes that away from her by saying (laughs) the way you do that is by, you know, not telling them with this photo of the crater formerly known as Maldito because BBD bombed it. Yeah. It's also really cool because it's like, okay, so demons running amok in this universe is not unique to purgatory. It's unique to purgatory that these revenants are stuck there or what brought them back. But basically what Dolls is saying is that, you know, BBD is is not local. You know, they're they're government. They cover, you know, who knows how much area. And they dealt with this before in another town with, you know, disastrous consequences for that town. So it's almost like we have like a Sunnydale situation here where there are multiple Hellmouths. Yeah. And I mean, it's, 
we aren't left wondering too long either if Dolls had any hand in Maldito because he mentions that he tries to stop it. He did everything that he could to try to stop it. So there is that. But yeah, it's a little bit of a, yeah, it's a, it's a minor Sunnydale <laughs> situation. A little bit, yeah. Also, now that you mentioned it, we did get confirmation in this episode. Well, confirmation, I think they might have mentioned it last week, you know, in the last episode, and I don't remember. But, like, not only can the Revenants not leave Purgatory, but when they try, they burn. Yeah. So we did see that. With Levi, right? Was it Levi? Yeah, it's Levi, because um, Doc drags him across the, the line, and he burns. So we find that out. And, okay, now that I mentioned it, so it didn't take long for us, the audience, to find out that the cowboy from the well <laughs> is <laughs> Doc Holliday. Yay! But he's going by Henry in the series right now. But we, he sees a picture. If you missed it, he when he's going through Waverly's stuff, he finds a picture of himself, and it's, you know, labeled Doc Holliday, and they make several references. It's I think each time it's Levi who mentions, you know, he used to run with who he ran yeah. with. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And then he used to be Wyatt's best mm-hmm. friend. So, yeah, for now, it's like Winona and Waverly know him as Henry, and the Revenants are calling him Henry, but it's it's Doc Holliday, who's known for being a quick draw, and we see that in this episode as well. Yes. He best Winona. Yes. I mean, to be fair, it's not hard at this point to best Winona. I mean... It's true. She's new to the game. She's new to the game. Yeah, so I... <laughs> it's it's hard to... Well, yes, he best Winona. He must be missed out. But yeah, he's, he's, he was known for his quick draw. Another like little like nugget of, I guess, like Winona or mythology that we got this episode was brought up about by the Amalite wind chimes... Yes. So thank you for that, Mama Earp. So Dolls tells her that the homestead is like built on a bedrock of mm-hmm. the stuff and it's, you know, like protecting them. Also neat, I liked that it was wind chimes, that it was worked into wind chimes because in like yeah. ancient Rome, India, and China, wind chimes were thought to ward off and even frighten lurking evil spirits. So this is like a two for charm against evil. That's sort of similar to Winona's necklace. Cause we talked about, you know, the beads being protection from the evil eye. And again, you know, Athena is the patron goddess of heroic endeavor and all that stuff. So I like that this wind chime, it was one of those, it was a similar thing. It was form and material are both protection against malevolent entities. I had forgotten about the wind chime thing. So yeah. like about what that means. I mean, not about the chime in the episode, but about what that means. So thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Because I had completely forgotten that wind chimes themselves were used to ward off evil. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I knew that it was, it existed on, among some culture. Like I thought in like, you know, Eastern culture, it was like, you know, something like that, but I had to look it up and I was surprised that it occurred in like, three different areas, you know? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I liked how they wasted no time, too, and, like, this is what protects the homestead. This is what happened to let the revenants on the homestead. Exactly. It's a really important rule. I like that, too. So I like that you just, you know, you set it out right there and, you know, sort of work it into the decor in the home. It's pretty cool. Which is interesting because if, okay, so let's say that wind chime was Amalite, which, I mean, it is. Because it's in that wind chime, does that mean the house was protected or, like, that immediate vicinity was protected? Because that talisman was affecting, like, the talisman was counteracting the amylite, like, the bedrock. Right. So, because it had to be buried. So I'm wondering if, like, what that wind chime would have done, if anything, because we know that revenants entered the home. The home. Right. But what if they, like, couldn't get around it or something? So I'm wondering what the... What the radius is on that wind chime and stuff like that. That's funny that you say that because I didn't link it to the talisman in my head, but I did think that it was really telling that it was inside the home and not like outside on the porch. Like this was something that they kept indoors with them that they lived around every day. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. See, there's more to that wind chime than I thought. (laughs) So thank you for that. I I appreciate all of your nerd research. 
Thank you. I love nerd research. I enjoy it. It makes me happy. (laughs) And I also enjoy it when somebody else does it and catches me off guard. It's exciting. (laughs) But yeah, we learn about the Amalite, which is super important. And since I'm already kind of in my ERP curse notes. Yeah. We learn that we don't know how many revenants Ford killed and Winona actually doesn't know. So that's a fun fact. And Edwin Earp, who was dubbed the one-year wonder, or a one-year wonder, he was the heir for 11 months and came close to sending all 77 revenants back to hell. So we've got a number for Winona to strive for. Edwin worked with Teddy Roosevelt, who helped to form Black Badge. I thought it was really cool, too, that Winona was like, Eleanor? Just because Eleanor (laughs) Roosevelt was so cool. So I was like, yeah, that's the Roosevelt I would pick, too. Like, nice. Yeah, I love that line so much. But yeah, I, I just wanted to mention those two. And the two revenants we do see why not a shoot in this episode, um, we see her shoot Rev and then Killer Miller, were both one of the se- like were two of the seven. Yeah. And Levi gets punished for telling. That's part of why Levi gets taken across the line because not only did he kind of defy Bobo, but you know, he mentions the seven to Winona and calls them, you know, mentions that the hunting party has three dead heirs under their belt. So the seven's kind of a hardcore bunch and Winona's already killed three of them. Yeah. So I think that's kind of a important note as well. So we've got, and it's funny because like, out, like you've got red Malcolm and Jim so far of the seven and you wonder what makes two of them so special. Right. Because you've got like, Killer Miller, who's a shadow assassin. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other two who are just like what they, they aren't anything too special. So the summoning of Shadow Miller was pretty cool. It's like a reverse story of Passover. In the story of Passover, lamb's blood was smeared over the doorposts of the Israelites that Moses sought to free. So that the final plague, which was the death of the firstborn son of every household, would literally pass over those marked homes. But Doc, a.k.a. Henry, smears his blood above the door to call forth a shadow that will kill Waverly, kind of making her the sacrificial lamb in this scenario. And he sends the monster to her door. Even the shadow itself kind of harkens back to that story of Passover, because in Exodus, it said the spirit of the Lord knew to pass over these homes. So spirit, shadow, really interesting parallels. I think a lot of overlap. I think too much overlap, in my opinion, for it to be accidental, (laughs) but it really could, it really could just be all of that Christian imagery I, you know, I was raised on. So I don't, I don't know. What, how do you feel about that? I mean, I, it's definitely an interesting take. I, and I don't, I don't think it's a wrong take. I think it's fair to take something like that because you don't know, like, you pulled that out because of your upbringing, so we don't know, like, where the writers might have gotten this idea and stuff like that. So exactly. I was not expecting that <laughs> from you at all. <laughs> so as mentioned, I enjoy it when you do that to me, where you catch me off guard. I should, like, full disclaimer, like, I was raised super religious, and I, like, I thought the Ten Commandments was, like, the coolest movie. <laughs> and, I'm, you know, like, not the cartoon one, you guys. Like, the old one with Charlton Heston and Ann Baxter and Yul Brenner. Like, I just, I loved it. It was the only way I would sit still for three hours on Easter Sunday was to sit down and watch that movie. So, anyway, that's how I grew up. <laughs> hey, there's no judgment. I'm just saying I know we, we grew up a little bit differently, so a lot of times you, little pull, bit. Out, <laughs> you pull out – the religious stuff that I just miss. My focus during that scene was, Doc, why did you cut your palm? That was where I was at. And it's like, so my my focus on that scene was more, why the heck did you just cut your palm? And Killer Miller doesn't give them any time to give them the actual target before he decides, you know, oh, you're the target. So <laughs> it's that that's so, where I was at with it. I'm curious, like, what do you... What do you want him to cut? Like maybe just the tip of his finger and not his trigger finger? I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't like, why, why always the palm? It's always the palm of your hand. And just 
that's wildly inconvenient. I don't know. Like, there are other places you can cut that isn't the palm of your hand. So, I don't know. True. Yeah, that's true. But I, I think it also shows, like, offering. You know what I mean? Like, we connect, like, as human beings, like, we connect hands with the the giving or taking or making of things. So I guess visually it kind of makes sense that if you're going to give something, if you're going to offer something, you would offer it with your hand. Well, I guess that's a there's total, that that's way a total of... That's a random tangent, too. <laughs> yes, there's that way of thinking about it, and he is the quickest draw of the West and all that stuff because he's Doc Holliday. So, alrighty, I will give you that one. <laughs> well, I'll I'll give you I'll give you your point too because it, it's sort of a greater gift, right, for him to injure his hand when he's sort of known for how fast they are. So that was a solid point. <laughs> that sounds odd out of context. Also, while we're on that moment, an important another important thing of that is Doc seems to be afraid of the dark because he says something. Yeah, you know, I can't go back in the dark. The dark, but somebody who's been in a well, I guess you kind of expect that. And the shadow monster goes after Waverly. Like, poor Waverly for no. everybody keeping track. She is 2-0 and o for the hits put out on her person, dude. Like, people are just all about killing that girl. Yeah, well, I mean, in all fairness, Doc didn't mean to do that. Right, yeah. And I mean, like, he, he, he didn't, like, intend for that to happen. He had no idea what was going to happen. He just took the ledger of outlaws that she had and, you know... I wonder what he was going to do with it. I do too. I love how he took that, the photo of him, and a pair of champ's pants. They're really bedazzled pants, too. Just Yeah, they're they're really special. And I like how Waverly just kind of brushes it off as him being like a crazy Wyatt fan. And doesn't at all question why he wanted to keep those pants. Like... It doesn't, it's not something like wear your own jeans or something like that. She's just like, oh, he's just a crazy Wyatt fan. Like, girl, what is your problem? I love you, but. <laughs> you know, like, to be fair, though, she is an expert at, like, writing things off. Like, her entire family has to be so skilled at, like, repressing everything just to make it through the day. Nah, that's, that's, that's fair. I actually. That, like, let, I want to stay on that for just a second. The, Gus tells Winona to grab the gun, like, when Red enters Shorty's bar. Mm -hmm. And this stood out to me because, like, in the previous episode, she refuses to talk about the circumstances surrounding Curtis's death. Mm -hmm. And at one point calls Winona's, like, mental faculties into question. Yeah. So she says, yeah, she says she's off her meds. But Gus clearly knows what's going down in this mm -hmm. town. Like, she knew to be afraid of Red. She probably knew exactly who he was. And before his eyes started glowing, like, she, you yeah. know, like, knew the score. So what do you think about all that? Like, why would she... I, I think it's just, like... I think it's a coping mechanism. Like, I think she just refuses to talk about it and represses it and pretends that she doesn't know so she can keep living her life. Well, I mean, it is a coping mechanism. And I think also, I mean, she was attacked by revenants. So right. it becomes harder to really ignore stuff like that when she was attacked. I do love that, that scene where it's funny how, cause I, was, I mentioned last uh, episode that like, I don't, Gus is hard to like in the first episode. But even her next episode, you kind of, she grows on you that much more with like the couple of uh, lines she has. But I do have to say, I love that scene when she's like, grab the gun and that little zoom in shot on Peacemaker on the bar. <laughs> yeah. I love that little zoom in shot. It's just, it, I, I, it's so much fun. There's a few shots and stuff like that and a few things they do that just, I love like the editing and the directing decisions that they make like that. I I do too, and that's what made me feel like it wasn't just. I think I I think I kind of missed this when I was saying it earlier. I she didn't it, the way that it, it played out. It didn't just feel like she knew that Red was a revenant to me. Mm -hmm. It felt like she understood Peacemaker's role yeah. in all of this, and that was really I think what what stood out to me mm -hmm. the most. But yeah, you I mean you you addressed it. Like I guess it gets a lot harder to kind of put on the back burner when it's your life in in danger yeah and i mean i'm i'm sure that waverly and winona 
and Gus probably had some bit of conversation about what happened. Maybe yeah. something, it probably wasn't as in depth as maybe it would have been had it been somebody else, but I'm sure they had some form of conversation about what happened. So, you know, it makes it a lot harder to put your head in the sand like that in those cases. So it, you know, I think. <laughs> no, I, I get what you're, yeah, I get yeah. what you're saying though. Yeah, absolutely. A lot harder to push mm-hmm. something like that aside. Yeah, I like that moment. I like that, just that you're right, they get the gun. And even like her grabbing whatever it's what does she grab she like arms herself with something and i cannot think of what it is i want to say it's a baseball bat but no no it's some sort of like it's like an electric knife or something oh okay yeah 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 yeah. so that's just funny i love that that whole that whole scene you know especially when it's like they're you know sitting down to eat and gus is like drinking wine or something and it's like it's medicinal when Winona says something about it, and it's like, well, she may not actually be an herb, like, officially, but she might as well be. <laughs> we also get, like, Waverly calling herself an herper in this episode. Yes, yes. Which, which she... is, yeah, just a, yeah, beautiful moment when, and she names the fandom. She Waverly does. names us. Mm-hmm. It's, it feels only right, but yeah, I like how, I like that interaction with Doc, because she just goes on about how she's an excellent judge of character and stuff like that. So Henry is just like, no, you really aren't. And I kind of love that. I also like how she accidentally invites him up to her apartment. (laughs) And then is like, well, you're not my, I don't mean it like that. You're not my type. And then he says, darling, I'm everybody's type. (laughs) And like, I have to agree. I mean, I'm, I'm very gay, but (laughs) you can't not like Doc. It's true. He's got something. Yeah. So I love that, that first introduction. I do too. And I I love, like, I just love how well they can balance, like, that level of levity against, Mm -hmm. like, more, like, heartfelt moments, you know? Because we get to, yeah, like, we get to the, you know, here Waverly is, like, being so dorky and so silly and just making us laugh and so oblivious, you know, like, to everything. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, we're at the homestead and... You know, she's breaking all of our hearts because no one bothered to chart her measurements on that door frame. You know what I mean? And, like... Yeah. Yeah, and it's not only, like, that emotional, like, moment. Like, it feels like she's been, oh, like, painfully aware that she Mm -hmm. doesn't rank, like, her whole life. So even that is, like, really at odds with, like, the oblivious Waverly that we see at the bar and... Oh, mm-hmm. I need to talk more about that later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just put a That's note what I'm in, too. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, oh, definitely. And, like, it is, it's such a gut punch when, when Winona and Waverly are having that conversation. And she's just, like, you know, she tries to tell her that it probably just brushed off. And, I mean, in some regards, you know, we do find out, we have confirmation that when the homestead was attacked, Winona was 12 and Waverly was 6. And then right. their mother left when Waverly was four. So yeah. part of that was, you know, Waverly might not have been on there or she might have been just like too small. So maybe she did have some marks on there at some point. But, you know, just it was maybe for some reason it just it just stopped. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's she does give you the emotional gut punch. <laughs> yeah. You can always count on her for that. You really can it's hard not to like get emotional whenever we really get upset and stuff like that. And she has a number of moments because, you know, she finds out that she's responsible in a way for the revenants being able to get onto the homestead and attack them. Yeah. I actually had a similar note on that. And my focus was sort of, she actually says in that moment that she has been blaming Winona for what happened yeah. to Ward and Willa and I kind of, I think I forgot about that. It's it's obvious that she loves her sister, but I didn't know she was like, or I guess I didn't remember that she was carrying that around with her. Yeah. Uh, at least until she, yeah, you're right. At least until she learned about the talisman. Mm-hmm. Well, it's funny because we don't get any hints of that in the first episode. No, you don't. Right. I made a comment about it when we were recording last week because we didn't see, Waverly didn't own up to blaming Winona. She just made sure to reassure her that it was an accident when Winona was talking right. about it. So, yeah, I do like, Waverly has a lot of layers, and I like that we're, we're really, we get to see that very early on. I mean, Winona too. Yeah. So I like that we kind of get to see their layers early. Because, yeah, I mean, she buried this talisman because her imaginary friend, Bobo, told her to. 
and you know it's he told her it would stop their parents from fighting and i thought that was curious because we had just been told that their mother had been gone for two years already true but i don't think we know like when he planted that necessarily could have been planned you know far in advance could have been a long game to get rid of ward i don't know i kind of i got the impression though that it happened like very close to the to the attack like full disclosure so did i i'm just giving them the benefit of the doubt oh. okay <laughs> sorry i'm with you on that, that. flew I am, over yeah. my head i'm sorry <laughs> it was like but this <laughs> yeah sorry benefit of the doubt sorry <laughs> no you're you're right though it's a really solid point yeah there was a lot to it i like how she you know buried it with pikachu the hamster <laughs> I love that she crosses herself, like, right before she digs Oh, yeah. Up. I mean, and just that whole bit with her digging it up and, you know, Waverly's arms. Congratulations on your arms, Waverly. Congratulations. <laughs> and that, like, I seriously just want to know it's Waverly's arms that she's digging. And then once she gets it up, like, her throwing the talisman to get Levi off the land. Like, girl, you could have just kept it in your hands. It would have gotten rid of him anyway, because the whole point was it had to be buried to counteract the Amalite. <laughs> But she just, like, throws it, kind of, like, does the throwing motion to get him off the land. And I like how excited she is about it. <laughs> I do, too. And, like, like staying on Waverly for a second, I think I can say this without spoilers. And I, th I want you and I to have, like, a little bit of this discussion now for anybody who's watching for the first time. Because this isn't really spoilery. But, like, you know, we see... Like we talked about, you know, we see Oblivious Waverly, like, mm -hmm. at the bar with Doc Holliday, and mm -hmm. then, you know, later in the episode, we, you know, Dolls is, like, offering her, you know, he's offering her a spot, he's, like, super impressed with her research abilities, mm -hmm. you know, and he's this, yeah, he's this, like, government agent who's giving Winona all of this information, and he really admires Waverly's, like, work ethic, and yeah. all this sort of stuff. So, basically, like, what I, what I'm trying to say is just, like, you know, it goes back to Nicole's comment of, like, you know, you're the most popular girl in this town, and, like, all of this stuff. I think we see, you know, in, it's funny, in Winona, we see this person who has just sort of given up on the opinions of others, right? Yeah. Like, she knows, she knows she can't change it. She knows she's stuck. She knows she's the black sheep of the town. Yeah. She's going to be the scapegoat for whatever, and she just sort of throws her hands up and throws a middle finger in the air, and she's like, whatever, like, deal with it. It's not my problem. Right. And then Waverly, we just see, like, all of these different faces of Waverly. You know, like, one second she's, you know, like, smiling and making nice with this rando, you know, Doc, who just, like, walks into the bar, pays for his drinks, making small talk with him, like, playing this oblivious character. And then, you know, we see it in the end of the episode that she's, you know, like, she's basically a genius, you know? Like, yeah. Doc, Dolls is, like, so impressed by her and, like, all of the work that she's done and everything that, you know, she's put into her research. And I think this is the first time that we really see those sides of her, like, at odds with each other in a single episode. I think this might be the first time that that happens. And, you know, mild spoilers won't be the last. Yeah, I mean, because we do, I mean, we know she was doing research and we know she was going to school and stuff like that. Like, that she, you know, she went to school in some regard. I think we find that out last episode. Yeah. If not, then oops. But, <laughs> no, we at least know that she does the research. But it is, I do enjoy how they use, how they've created this character. Yeah. And it all goes back to, you know, like Waverly, ta tailoring Waverly for her audience. You know, whether it's this r random guy at the bar, or whether it's, you know, mm -hmm. a black badge marshal, or whatever. You know, because it's the, like we talked about before, this compulsive need to be liked. And so she pre presents whatever she thinks is palatable, or whatever she thinks is needed. I mean, yeah. Well, and then part of that is especially at the bar has to be because you know you treat your customers a certain way you learn how to you know treat people a certain way when you work in a like a, as a bartender or like a waitress what have you you do learn kind of how to talk to people certain people a certain way in order to make them like you you know in order to yeah. just you want to get the tips that you <laughs> so i think that's part of it too it's like every bit of it is just a really excellent you know, way of her, her to, like, show that she she does kind of... She's not just the little sister who doesn't know anything. You know? Right, yeah. She's not the little sister who's just going to cause trouble and get in the way. 
Dawn Summers. What is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, we are not going to start bashing Dawn Summers on this podcast. Kay, thank you. It was, it was so quick. And look, now it's over. See, now it's done. I got it out of my system. We moved past it. Uh huh. Yeah, we're going to talk about this later. All right. <laughs> take it. We'll take it off the air. <laughs> <laughs> no. So it's a. You start to. You know, Waverly has some good moments. I mean, she gets the shotgun again. I love Waverly and her shotgun. And yeah. I like how she refuses to hide. You know, Winona desperately tries to get her out of the way. And even going as far, you know, as telling her to, like, go hide in a closet, which just makes me laugh. But no, she, she like, pulls out her shotgun. She's like, no, I'm going to help. Like, they're not taking the homestead. So I enjoy that. I think it's funny, like, how much of this podcast is just me nodding at my microphone like anyone can see me. Yeah, the number, I talk with my hands and stuff like that and sometimes I do it's bad see the downside of well no I'm not going to say that because I would hate for this to be any sort of visual <laughs> nobody needs to watch me talk but yeah I'm the same way whenever you're talking I'm like yeah yeah and then I'm like I forget yeah. to actually say something <laughs> exactly so yeah I do and and Waverly does get to be in, in BBD much to I'm sure my Nona's annoyance <laughs> because she wanted to keep her safe and that's not how you keep her safe yeah, but I don't. I don't really think anybody can say no to her research abilities and banana nut muffins. Like, oh no, no, you right. cannot, not one bit. I do like Winona's like constant annoyance at the fact that she's uh, that Waverly is dating Champ. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> like when they're at the gun range, which we haven't talked about yet. But yeah, when she's at the when they're at the gun range and they just kind of uh, Waverly and Champ drive. By and this is where we get the little tidbit of information that dolls apparently doesn't like do relationships or whatever. But I just enjoy Winona being like constantly annoyed about Champ. Yeah, I do too. And I think that's like a real like older sibling thing. It's just like, oh, you could do so much better. Like, what are you doing? Oh, one hundred percent. Especially because, like I mentioned last week, you know this skeezy jerk tried to hook up with Winona. He's dating Waverly. <laughs> and he's trying to hook up with her sister. Like, no, he's a piece of crap. Yeah, really no redeeming qualities. No, none whatsoever. I don't understand. So maybe she'll find somebody else. Who knows? Who knows? One of the, oh, I did have a gun range note, though, just because I, I mentioned it. I do like how Winona gets really excited about firing, like, the really big guns. <laughs> and how, like, she really wants a flamethrower. I think yeah. she needs one. You know what? I do, that too. Is. And Waverly says something, too, about it, too. When uh, she gets sold, she gets to be a, a VBD consultant. I think Waverly makes a comment about a flamethrower, too. That, like, gun range scene also had, like, one of my absolute, like, favorite quotes of the episode, which was, like, Winona's, have a little faith. We survived hot dog stuff. Or, yeah, hot dog stuff. Oh, yeah. Pieces, <laughs> so I think we got this. I love that so much. I watched it, like, three times. Yeah, that's, it, that always makes me laugh, too. There's so many... We're not there yet, but there's so many good, quotable things about this show. And I adore it, which is why my quotes list is um, is the longest piece of any of my podcast notes. Which is probably something I should change. <laughs> but, okay, let's no, see. Same, yeah, same here. What are some of our other, like, big moments? Do we have other big moments to talk about? Oh, yeah, we kind of do. It's Bobo! We, we've completely ignored Bobo for Yay. most of this. We do meet the lead Revenant, and he has the most ridiculous name that's really hard to keep take seriously. But we do find out that, you know, Bobo has a plan for getting them free, and he's getting a little frustrated with the Revenants who don't listen to him. So he punishes uh, Levi by having him sent off, you know, by having Doc drag him across the line, mm -hmm. and... Yeah, where we find out that revenants burn, burn, burn. We get like a we get a physical difference too. You know, most revenants they all bear the same mark, and it's very small. Uh, but Bobo's is his entire back is that symbol that we associate. You know, like with the revenants, it's their mark. The, yeah. So yeah, that's. I was just getting there. Yeah, so he's it is a big difference. He's got that huge brand on his back, and you wonder since it. It went like it lit up when Levi was dragged across the the line. Does it? Did it just happen because of proximity, or is that something that happens every time a revenant is killed? Or is it something that they can control? 
Well, I think, because we do see, like, when Red gets excited at the end of the previous episode about, like, you know, the it's a war party, his brand kind of lights up, or, yeah, burns, and then we see yeah. all the other revs who do it, too. So right. it seems like some of it, or it might be, like, a, an emotional thing in some way. But it's just interesting because there's definitely a standout with Bobo and how it just completely covers his back. Yeah. It's it's definitely interesting. And, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was just an excuse for them to make Michael Eklund shirtless for that one scene. I don't know. Although I don't know why anybody would want to get rid of those go- gorgeous furs, like, even for a second. Uh, his, his, he does have some fabulous coats. <laughs> yeah. His fur, his fur game is on point. Uh, he also, I like, I just... I think it's really, he has this weird tendency to, like, bite the air that I just, like, I oh, really yeah. associate with Bobo, and I just think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, he does. I didn't remember him doing that in this episode or not, but I guess I get focused on, I actually, since we're kind of talking about that last scene, I love that transition of Doc walking into the Revenant camp from, like, the homestead. We see him walk out of the homestead into the dark, and I kind of love that transition of him walking kind of into the the campfire or the torchlight it's torchlight and stuff yeah so i love that transition so much i mean and that last scene is so dramatic and you know with the torches and how the music is and everything but yeah i I love that transition Mm -hmm. we also find out that there's something that bobo has that doc wants we're not sure it's at this point it's quote the woman who changed him and so that was why he's been working with the Revenants, is Bobo has something for him. And for now, he's kind of gotten in Bobo's good graces. So Doc may not be a friend to Winona like she thinks <laughs> at this point. Even though he did replace their mailbox because it was defiled by hooligans. <laughs> you do, I do really enjoy the way he speaks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Winona's impression of him saying that, I didn't do it by any means, by uh, justice by any means, but I love that line so much because <laughs> it just how her delivery is great. I do, there's a, I had a few random, was there anything big though before we kind of get into some of the more? I covered my big points. I think I covered mine too. I just like to make sure, you know, because I had a few sure. smaller ones. We do find out that Nedley tried looking into dolls in Black Badge and couldn't get any information. He called Washington and Ottawa, and nobody had heard of Dolls' division. And I like how Dolls is just like, well, it's a it's a secret organization, so... <laughs> he's he's very upset about Dolls stealing half of his offices and having to share his kitchen. I'm not sure what he's most upset <laughs> about, though. I bet it's the kitchen. Nobody wants to share kitchens with strangers. Nobody. That's real. <laughs> you do, yeah, yeah, no. You, you, I think there's like a certain amount of like office vetting that needs to happen in advance. Yeah, you can't just, yeah, it's, it's, you can't mess with somebody's kitchen in the workplace. You just can't. No. You've got to like follow them to the bathroom to make <laughs> sure they wash their hands. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> just me? <laughs> just me? I know, I know worry for all of your coworkers. <laughs> No, I, no, 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 no. I'm keeping them honest. <laughs> I'm warning everybody. You don't want to eat that if she prepared it. Like, uh-uh. <laughs> oh, God. So, you're a workplace nightmare. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> you know, I used to be, I think. Uh, not so much, not so much anymore. I work for, like, a small privately owned company now, and it's, like, really chill, and I'm one of, like, three girls. So, it's, like, you know. So you can easily stalk other women in the bathroom to make sure that they wash their hands. That's what you're saying? Not, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> because all of the restrooms are private, single stall. So I just have to take it on faith that everybody is as hygienic as I am. <laughs> as a result, I eat very little food other people have prepared. I have trust issues, man. Trust issues. Apparently. I mean, I don't blame you. Not one bit. Anyway, uh, so... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. It's quite all right. One of the things, back to some of the Revenant stuff, one of the things I thought was interesting, Levi mentioned having, like, human familiars. So I thought it was an interesting way to kind of talk about the humans that they have around them. So, I mean, I guess they, they must use them because they can't leave the triangle. So I guess the familiars maybe 
go out and get stuff for them too, in addition to just kind of doing some of the things, like just doing the things that they can't, I guess. Yeah. But no, I thought him calling them familiars was interesting because it was, you know, you don't normally hear like use of the word familiar in this context. No, you really don't. It's, I feel like I associate it more with like, like witches yeah. and then more with uh, animals, not really uh, human familiars quite so much. Although I suppose I also think of like Dracula's uh, Renfield that right. he also comes to mind. So you think of somebody either in a thrall or they're to help. And so it was just, it was interesting to, to phrase it like that. Like you wonder what powers these revenants have. Are they just scary? So they get people to do their bidding or is there something more to it? Yeah. Do they have like their own, do they have thrall? Yeah. Like can they enthrall or beguile people? Nice word. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, uh, that's a, you know, it gives you that throwaway line kind of does give you some, something to think about. So yeah, like that's that. really cool. I, I actually, I didn't catch that. I'm glad you brought it up. You're welcome. Let's see. I do like how, when they find out about like back to Waverly and Wynna, sorry, I'm trying to go through my random notes. So I'm going to be all over the place. I'm always all over cool. the place. I don't know why I'm apologizing. This stuff I do. <laughs> 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 now that I think about it, I do like how Winona and Waverly, when it goes dark and they know something's amiss, they like have their jammies on and just go outside with the campfire and everything. Yeah. I really like that. And it made me laugh when like Waverly and Winona are running to the pet cemetery to get to the talisman. For some uh -huh. reason, Waverly just kind of like takes off her robe as she's running. And just, like, leaves it in the middle of the road. <laughs> True, yeah. And it's like, that has to be cold, though, because they do film in Canada. And oh, yes, I know yeah. this was still, like, I think it might have been September or October, maybe. But that still feels like, I, like, I still would assume it's kind of cold outside. It's but, yeah, I mean, at least chilly, right? Yeah. So I can't, I can't imagine, like, <laughs> having to, like, sit outside for hours and stuff like that doing those takes. But at least they got to put their jammies on. Because I do like Winona threatening um, Levi when she's got her slippers on. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, because he's, like, you know, trying to, he, you know, this is where we get that information about the, se the seven, like I mentioned earlier. And, you know, he mentions that they have three dead heirs under their belts. And she's like, I'm going to just keep threatening you with my moccasins <laughs> and jammies. <laughs> yeah. So I enjoy that. Oh, that was a doc note I had. We still don't know what's up with Doc. So we find out that he's Doc Holiday. We find out that he's not a revenant, but Bobo also kind of calls him like not a man. Like, yeah. And we get the impression that he's not really human either. So it's, we, I, you know, we have no idea what's up with Doc, how he ended up, you know, seemingly immortal or cursed or whatever is happening. So we do, we're learning little bits, little bits and pieces of Doc. Yeah. I had some Killer Miller attacks the homestead notes. Mm -hmm. I love the lightning, the light, not lightning, the light bolt effect when Winona shoots uh, Killer Miller. I think it's a really, like, it's a really awesome effect. And I just like how she just kind of lights him up a few times before actually killing him. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. And I liked her little like flare move to get his attention because it totally uh -huh. reminded me of Jurassic Park. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So. With the T-Rex, yeah. Yeah, I, I put that note and I was really excited about it because of my love for Jurassic Park, so. I feel you. And I think that was all the random crap that I had that wasn't in, that wasn't a spoiler. Was there anything else you had on your list before we go into quotes? No, that's it for me. I always have way too much random stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost sorry about it. No, I like random. All right, so favorite quotes. Well, I think we already did, you know, crazy chick with a gun. And we we spent some time on Nicole, deservedly so. My favorite, like, line in that moment is, you know, Waverly sort of stammering, I'm in a relationship with a boy, a man, a boy man. <laughs> and Nicole sort of, you know, like laughing it off and, you know, being like, I've been there, it's the worst. Yeah, and I just I I think I love it so much because like could there be a more apt description of Champ? Like he is a boy man. Like, that's I know. what he is. <laughs> it's so great. I love that so much. No, that's a good one. I just I love that entire scene and 
I had just so many notes on that for what is like a two to three minute scene, <laughs> like 14 notes. Quarter of our podcast spent on it. Yeah, I mean, it's, and, I'm, yeah, I'm not ahead. mad about it ever talking, spending a lot of time on way on uh, why not? I'm sorry, Waverly and Nicole. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no I also really like, I also really like, I've got a good feeling about you and I'm an excellent judge of character. We talked about that too. Mm-hmm. I think we've covered quite a few of these. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about the yoga mat line. I love the, when Winona tells uh, Waverly that she can't go back home, like she goes back to her apartment and Waverly's just like, but my yoga mat is in there. <laughs> yeah. Doc has a couple of funny throwaways um, after his trailer gets vandalized. Because they write, uh, what is it, bitch on it, I think. Mm-hmm. And, well, I seem to have settled, am- I seem to have settled amongst a commune of artists. <laughs> but he says artists, and it's great. <laughs> because his accent is fabulous. Oh, when Red asks, why don't I know where Peacemaker is? The, it's in my panty drawer, why don't we go get it? Uh, I enjoyed Gus saying, get away from my girls, you nutsack, right after yelling at Winona for using the word nutsack. Yeah. I like, I like a cultish that is so specifically vague. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that I had that one on here or not, which is surprising. But no, there's just, I, Doc has so many great lines in this because it's like you outlaws sure have gotten dramatic since you were human. And no, what do you get for the demonic sociopath that, ha- sociopath that has everything? A braver man would suggest mouthwash. Yeah. Oh, and the vibrator joke. There was a vibrator joke. <laughs> Winona has the, the Revenants can't hold Peacemaker, uh, not without vibrating faster than a, you know, I have my toys, you have yours. Yes. Almost forgot to mention that one. I really like the, but you're just a girl line. Yes. And, you know, Winona, yeah, Winona says, I'm the girl with a big ass gun. That's it. It's, it also shows up in Buffy, season five, The Gift. And Buffy, who who may be even an even more reluctant superhero than mm-hmm. Winona Earp is, you know, she responds, that's what I keep saying. But I really like that Winona's response to that is, I, I am the girl with a big-ass gun. Like, Yes. Yeah. And there's a few, like, we get that, you know, Waverly saying shit ticket. So that, that was pretty great. Oh, and the Ammonite, the material found... You've, this material found around here, unless you can smoke it, I really wouldn't know. <laughs> Between yeah. balls and I don't know. And I do like the little tidbit that Doc drops about why it didn't drink. He preferred ice cream. Yeah, I always take a lot of quotes, but it's hard to, I can't pick them. I need to start just picking one per character, but I think even that's going to be difficult. I Yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> just, I'm just going to sit here just, with a transcript do it. of the episode yeah, and there just we go. Yeah. read the episode for the, the whole podcast. That's going to be our new thing. Perfect. <laughs> and then I get... That'll this. be a dream to edit. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, you can edit that. Yeah, go ahead. Dibs out. That was your idea. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But I think that's kind of going to wrap up our spoiler-free section of the podcast. Yeah. Um, so if you remember from last week, we're doing our spoiler free talk and then we're going to do our little outro and then we're going to start talking a few spoiler items. So unless there was anything else that you wanted to mention. No, I'm good. Okay. So I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you so much for listening. If you, you, you've seen the show and want to stick around for the spoiler talk, just hang on. If you haven't seen the show, this is your first watch, just make sure you uh, turn off the podcast after we tell you where to find us. So, Lara, where can they find you? You guys can find me on Twitter at R.S. Mayfair. All right. So you can find the podcast on Twitter at 4YE underscore MYP podcast, and that is the number four. You can find me on Twitter at CMUSHA, that's at C-M-E-U-S-H-A-W. And you can also, both Laura and I write for 4YE, and you can find that at 4 underscore Y underscore E. If you're interested in checking out some of our Wine on Art pieces or some of our non Wine on Art pieces. So I think that about does it. Thank you so much again for listening. And turn it off now if you're not in for a spoiler discussion.
Alrighty. So if you're sticking around, that means hopefully you've seen the episode or, or seen the future episodes, or you just really like to spoil yourself. <laughs> Before and you who see. are we to judge? No, no judgment at all. So thanks for sticking around. And where do we want to start for our spoiler discussion? I'd like to move back to Waverly. I think most of my, like, spoilery discussions sort of center around uh, her character, which she's my favorite, so I think it makes a lot of sense. But mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I, I really think it's funny, you know, that whole, we, we, we talked about this earlier, you know, she really, she has a compulsive need to be liked. She sort of tailors the Waverly that she presents to what she perceives the other person wants to see or wants or needs from her. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we see this in the interaction with Doc, who she's never met, who she's buying drinks for, who she's chatting with. She smiles. She jokes. This, like, she doesn't know this man. That's kind of, right. I guess, like, what I want to drive home. Who cares what he thinks? Or, like, she cares. She cares mm -hmm. what this stranger thinks about her. And... This, you know, obliviousness that, you know, she sort of, you know, projects, it, it's, all, it's all an act, you know, like, Waverly is, is not oblivious, you know, she's, uh, she's very present, she's very bright, mm -hmm. uh, and so all of this is just, you know, an attempt to sort of make herself more palatable to, to anyone that she encounters. It comes up later in season two, it's why known as Baby Shower. You know, like, she's talking mm -hmm. about, like, needing to be liked and, like, that sort of thing. It's just a recurring thing with this with this character. And I really like that moment with Doc because you and I know that Doc is not evil. He, right. he does have his own agenda that he's pursuing mm -hmm. right now against the Stone Witch, but he's not a bad man. So Waverly might actually be a great judge of character. Like, mm -hmm. she takes to Nicole immediately. She takes to Rosita immediately. She takes to Doc right away, and, you know, he's destined to become the father of her niece and a staunch ally. It, Champ is a tool, but she doesn't delude herself about that. Right. She doesn't lie for him. She doesn't, She doesn't. you know, extol his virtues beyond brawn. You know, she brings up, like, how strong he is. That's an undeniable attribute. Mm -hmm. And in the first episode, when Winona kind of goes after him, you know, like, what are you doing? You know, like, she doesn't even defend him to Winona. Right. It's, I mean... It's, I've got limited dating options, and I guess in some regard for her, it's, you know, better to have somebody in this moment than to not, or something like that, just because it's, you know, Champ, in his way, kind of does love Waverly, and that's what she wants. Also, we glossed over this, talking Hang early. on one second, because I think you just brought up something really important, and I want to underscore the point you just made. You know, yeah, she's with this, she's with Champ, who's, you know, a massive tool, but she's totally alone. Like, mm -hmm. she's got Gus, and, you know, Shorty is very kind to her, and she just lost Curtis. But, you know, her father, her mother, both of her older sisters are gone. Like, this girl just wants to be loved. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then one of the things I wanted to mention while you were talking that I realized we kind of glossed over it in our discussion earlier with Waverly saying that she was an Erper, that was all about, you know, I'm, I don't, like... I know what the last name Erp carries sometimes. So it's not even a, it, it partially could be like, I know something's happened and the revenants are a little bit more active right now. So I don't want to tell people I'm an Erp, but also this is somebody I've just met. Maybe I don't want to tell him that I'm an Erp and have him judge me. So sure, yeah, <clears throat> that popped into my head that we didn't, we kind of glossed over earlier. So that's not necessarily a spoiler thing, but it is a, Catherine forgot to mention it earlier, so I'm mentioning it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of Waverly spoilery things to have in this, in this episode, and this, a lot of spoilery discussion to have just because we also, Bobo tells Waverly that it has to be an herb that buries the talisman. Yeah. And. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've talked about this for those of you who have listened to our season two episodes, we've talked about this before. And you wonder if, like, I, I'm going to bring it up again, but you wonder if he says that because there's something, like, he knew it was an easy act, like, an easy way to get her to do something, to be like, oh, yeah, like, this is how, you know, you're because of the weight for her, you know, that being an ERP has, you know, how important it is and stuff like that. You know, it has to be an ERP, or if it truly did have to be an ERP. Because, 
I still don't think we necessarily have a solid answer about any of that. I feel I we don't. I absolutely agree with you. I do not think that we have a concrete answer one way or the other. Whether she's an ERP, how much is she an ERP? You know what I mean? Like, is yeah. she some distant cousin that they, I, I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, because they have that whole thing where they think, like, Bobo is, is her father and stuff like that. But I don't know. Yeah. It's, there's the red a lot herring there. of season two. Yeah, there's a lot there that I think hopefully will be explored in season three with yeah, now that so. we know that Mama Earp's coming into the picture. Yes. I do. I'm I'm looking forward to some of that because, yeah, we find out, you know, in this episode that their mother left when they were very young. But, I mean, Waverly really was four years old. Mm-hmm. So, I, but I thought that was, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out more about that as well. And we do, we, there's a few comments about how important Waverly is to Bobo in this episode. You know, he yeah. chose her to kind of, I don't want to say prey on, but he kind of targeted her and we find out later why that might be. Why, you know, Killer Miller tells Waverly that Bobo would be sad to lose her. Yeah. And I wonder what Bobo would have done had he found out that Killer Miller went after Waverly. Because I there's no it, indication... Yeah. That he knew. And I don't think Doc would tell him, hey, I accidentally sent it after Waverly. Well, and Doc does not, Doc does not know that. Doc has no idea that he, that Bobo has any kind of a connection to Waverly yet. Right. I mean, no, he doesn't. So he might have said it, but I don't think, you know, since he was told, get something of why not, I don't necessarily think that he would give more information than he really needed to, to Bobo. You know, other than I did what you asked me to. And it's interesting that Killer Miller seemed to know that Bobo was, Waverly was important to Bobo, but Levi's reaction to Waverly being targeted was, oh, that sweet little thing, not Bobo's going to be pissed. It was, oh, that sweet little thing, something like that. Or I forget exactly how he words it. Mm -hmm. Um, That might not have been it. But yeah, so I thought there's a lot, like, how much do the Revenants know other than leave her alone? We do find out that Levi is a little bit, he's not as bad as some of the other Revenants are. And I think also not quite as, he's not as inner circle, you know, right. like, yeah, not quite as committed to Bobo's cause as Miller might be. And there's also the whole thing of like Miller being a shadow and, you know, so he kind of has this ability to lurk unseen. Maybe he knows a little bit more about, you know, different you know, revenants than most other re- revenants do. And and we also know that, like, their powers vary slightly. So, mm-hmm. you know, he may, yeah, he may have a little bit more knowledge or insight than other revenants just by virtue of what he is. Yeah, and, and being one of the seven. Yeah, exactly. So I do, I, I don't know how I routinely forget we get three of the seven down by the second episode. Like, I, I also forget, forget how that. quickly we blow through the seven. Because our, I mean... Our last one's in episode eight. So I kind of, I forget how quickly we get through them because I think we knock out another one next episode. Yeah. It makes sense though, you know, like for a season one, like plot, um, Oh yeah. Plot driver, you know, like vengeance, mm-hmm. like that's pretty, yeah, that's pretty yeah, standard. Definitely. And we found out a little bit more information about the Amalite. So we find out what it is that protects the homestead. And so it's Amalite, and Amalite comes up a few times throughout the series, namely that it's what Peacemaker is made of, or part of, like, Peacemaker is made up of Amalite. Um, And some, like, there's pieces, there's some Amalite, Amalite. yeah. And that's part of what makes it the gun to destroy the Revenants. So we do find out that. And that was pretty much all I had for spoiler talk, unless there's something hella important I'm not remembering. That's all I had to... Most of my spoiler stuff was, like, really Waverly-focused. I get so distracted by her. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. And it kept I kept remembering it because my spoiler section was, legit, like, blank before we started talking. And then as we were talking, I was adding to it because I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> I can't talk about that yet. I can't talk about that yet. I can't talk about that yet. So, all right. I think that kind of does it for our spoiler section, then. If there's stuff that we missed or anything that you want to talk more about, please let us know. We always answer DMs and stuff like that. And it's it's fun to kind of do this 
with the knowledge that we have of the yeah. future episode. <laughs> so, alrighty. Thanks again, guys. Thanks for sticking around, and we'll, we'll see you next week. Thanks, you guys.